Joined now by Darren Dreger, TSN Hockey Insider, Wednesday regular with us. Of course, one half of the Rain Drags Hockey Hockey Podcast. How are we doing? How's Ray holding up to the playoff travel and whatnot? I guess the Hudson series isn't much travel. Yeah, so far so good. Um, you know, based on what I've I've seen, and I only see Ray through our YouTube channel, right? When we're recording the Ray and Drags podcast. Um, but he seems in good spirits. I mean, the hockey has been fairly entertaining. It certainly hasn't been without controversy and lots of things for him to talk about. But hey, no different than any of us. When you're away from your fa- away from your family for an extended period of time, it kind of wears on you. So, as we recorded the podcast yesterday on on Tuesday, you know, he of course was hopeful without cheering for any one team that maybe a series ends early so he can That's get. Right. Back to Vancouver for a couple of days, but now nah, beyond that, you know, he's uh, he's enjoying what he's part of because there has been some pretty good hockey to this stage. Yeah, although the uh, Devils Rangers has not exactly been the must. Of all the of all the series to like, yeah. and there's been a bunch that have got sizzled to it. I have mm. heard the least talked about. For the two biggest, uh, you know, in the biggest market, there's 20 million people there. No, and I know. It, it's not getting talked about for whatever reason. Uh, I mean, that's a good point. You know, you saw the Rangers open up the series with two quick wins, and I think most of us went, well, that's a really good Ranger team, and evidently okay. the, the, the New Jersey Devils just aren't quite ready yet. Yeah. But then here come the Devils, and they bounce back and they level this series. So, you know, it'll be a compelling best of three. I don't think there's any question of that. How much swagger do the young Devils have in them going into that best of three versus, hey, I mean, Artemi Panarin's got to show up in this series. Chris Kreider was good early, but he's got to get going for the New York Rangers, and on and on it goes. Way more firepower on New York's side, but they haven't used it in the last couple of games. Quick updates from the from the playoffs before we get to some of the Canucks. Well, this is sort of Canucks. Bull Horvat has had a weird series with mm. the New York Islanders. What do you make of that? Cause, and, and yet the Islanders are – battling uh he had an assist the other night i mean it, it, he's there he last night yeah um but you know the bottom line is not there and yet the islanders look like they're still benefiting from him yeah no i get it and i think that they are i mean we know that he's a good two-way forward i think we also expected this series to be low scoring relatively low scoring i mean the new york islanders for whatever reason just can't generate any offense and we saw that through the better part of the regular season. And we can understand why the Carolina Hurricanes have trouble scoring because their top goal scorers aren't in the lineup. I mean, these Mm -hmm. guys are hurt. So, you know, given that the Islanders haven't been able to push offensively, you know, other than the other night, I mean, they they, they find a way to score three goals and they win and they stay alive in a series here. Um, But they're not taking advantage of the Carolina Hurricanes' deficiencies, and they're going to regret that. I mean, if the Islanders had any offensive push, be it from – you know, Horvat or Barzell is back healthy now. I know he scored a goal in the win, um, but they've got to generate more. Otherwise, the Carolina Hurricanes, that plays so beautifully into the concept and philosophy and style of the way they play, especially in round one of the playoffs. This is uh, a series that the Islanders are, are braced to lose because they're not generating offense. I'll give him credit, though, winning that game last night and, yeah. and extending yeah. it to at least six games. And here's the thing, Dregs. It was five first round series went to seven games last year. We only got one seven gamer from that point out. And when you take yeah. a look at the landscape here, I think Gary and the guys at at at, at HQ uh, must be pretty happy because I think <laughs> we're in line for some really long. Maybe with the exception of Boston, yeah. Florida, uh, I think uh, we're in line for some pretty exciting and thrilling finishes in game sixes or sevens. Right. And, and, I mean, you're right. And you look at the Tampa Bay Toronto series, um, you know, the reason I guess you don't put them in the category of Florida, Boston is, you know, who, you know, are we confident that the Maple Leafs are going to find a way to start on time? And I don't think we can be. No. And and then you look at the Tampa Bay Lightning and everything that they've done over the last few years, including two Stanley Cups and three st- uh, trips to the Stanley Cup final. Hey, Andre Vasilevsky hasn't been his best but if he throws his best at the Toronto Maple Leafs, then you could envision, you know, the Lightning stretching that series to uh, a Game 7. I, I think the hockey has been good. I know there's mm-hmm. been noise around officiating, but that's the case every year in Round 1 especially. And we've seen some controversial non-calls. We've seen some controversial calls and all of that. But we've seen an abundance of power plays, which leads to goals. 
I mean, again, to, to revisit that Tampa Bay Toronto series, first two games, there were 19 goals scored in that series. I mean, from a fan perspective, let alone, uh, you know, uh, an NHL head office perspective, I, I think that they believe that that bodes well for bringing new eyes onto the sport and into the postseason. So things will settle down now as you get to the later stages of round one and certainly into round two. But I think for the most part, there's been plenty to talk about. Let's get into some Canucks matters. Elias Patterson denied the insurance to attend the World Championships and play for Sweden. Greg, just walk us through that process as international ice hockey federations or, 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 or national sports federations have to go about securing the appropriate assurances for these yeah. players to play for their country. Right, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, these guys are either under contract or they're restricted free agents, or some will go to the World Championships without a contract period, and they're unrestricted free agents. And then that becomes a bit of a roll of the dice. Um, for players who opt to do that, you know, you need that insurance coverage because, you know, you're covering future earnings. And that gets complicated. That gets very tricky. And that's why player agents will often advise their clients who are coming up on a contract negotiation, don't go. Don't go. It's just not worth it. You might get hurt. And if you get hurt, you know, then that just lends itself to all sorts of, of complexities, right? When you're negotiating your next contract, or like I said, if you're an unrestricted free agent, you don't have a contract. It is a bit weird that Pedersen didn't get the insurance uh, coverage. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not like, did they detail exactly why? I mean, it, it could be a big number. You know, for starters, if you're if you're looking for coverage of a, a a contract, it can get pretty hefty when you're talking about a player of the magnitude of 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 Pedersen. But you know, beyond that, I, I don't think people realize how often that contributes to the decision, as I've described, of players not accepting invites. It's it's a bit strange with the European players, though, because normally, you know, the European federations put the pressure on the players. But insurance issues aren't issues because the federations just go, hey, don't worry about it. We've got you covered. The insurance isn't going to be a problem. We just need you to come over. It's a case of, of uh, I think, just the one year left on his contract. and it, So not quite the UFA scenario that you lay out, but I think it's yeah. the prospect of being able to sign a deal in the summer. Yeah. And, and probably what the client, in this case, Elias Pedersen, says is yeah, yeah. is what he needs to feel okay about it, I suppose. And I, I'm wondering, Greg, if, if this sort of, like, we don't necessarily – pour over this with a fine-tooth comb for every eligible player for the world. Does this happen more often than we think, and we just yeah. we don't hear about it, you think? It does. It absolutely does. And I, you know, I'd be curious to get J.P. Barry's take on it, who represents Patterson, but I, I, I'm, I'm almost positive that is what's going on here, because you're not worrying just about the year that he has remaining. You're obviously looking at the imminent extension, whenever they yeah. get around to that, and how big it's going to be. And just imagine worst case scenario if if he were injured at the World Championship, you know the Vancouver Canucks probably take a different approach with what sort of contract negotiations they may have in the summer. So I get it, and a hundred percent it happens more than we think. Normally, though, you know you just you don't dig into it, right? Unless it's a star player who wants that information disclosed, players turn down invites to play for their country all the time, and in fact. You know, I'm not being specific to this year, but there have been years where I think Hockey Canada was flat out disappointed, you know, just trying to almost beg players to come and represent Canada. Um, is that the case this year? Maybe. It's less so, it seems, with, again, the European federations. There's almost uh, an expectation that if you're out and Sweden calls, then you're going and you're playing. So, this is a bit of an outlier, I would say, but I, I think generally speaking, it does happen more than we think. Uh, new rink coming in Calgary. That's the news. One province yeah. over and also with the practice facility, which would leave the Vancouver Canucks as the only NHL team without one. How important are practice facilities in this day and age, Dregs? And uh, what do you make of the Canucks and Flames being the last two without it? Yeah, they're very important. I mean, obviously, they're, in many cases, the first home, if not, obviously, the second home of, of the organizations, right? Um, now, I can think of maybe top of the food chain, 
you know, with what the the Vegas Golden Knights have in Nevada, not that far uh, away from Vegas. But that's an area where generally the players like to live. And I've had the, the, the good fortune of touring that facility. Holy smokes. I mean, it is the Taj Mahal of practice facility. So you go, you've got the creature comforts, but there's also, you know, geographic convenience. So the players can jump in their vehicles and they're minutes away from their practice facility. And so, you know, a meeting isn't that big of a deal or a quick workout or, you know, a practice. I mean, it's just another layer of convenience for the players. And it's it's important. And it's it's a bit surprising that the Vancouver Canucks haven't pushed forward with any sort of, of conviction on this because it is needed. As As for the Calgary Flames... I think I was surprised as many that this agreement just seemed to come out of left field, didn't it? I mean, and you're not talking about, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge agreement between the Calgary Flames, the city, and the province. Uh, I mean, this is a multi-purpose facility to the tune of, what, $1.2, $1.3 billion? Normally we see deadlines. We we things need to go past deadlines and bubble. And it just that happened years ago. It did, and and it died. And now this just came out of nowhere. Well, look, and it's not that many years ago, right, Blake? I mean, you had the former mayor of of Calgary who pitted in and said, "No, I'm not going to use taxpayer money to prop up the Calgary Flames in a new facility." And they just couldn't come to terms on why it was so important. But again, anybody who's visited the Saddle Dome knows that this thing is it's like nassau coliseum man like just you know i get the history back in the day it was kind of a cool venue all of that but it's not even it is light years ahead of what is needed to run a national hockey league franchise you know in today's world and and you know look the juggling that goes around the, the NHL this time of year with playoffs. And the reason that you have two days off between, you know, game four and game five normally is because these new venues now are jam packed, right? They've got concerts that they, they book in the off season for next year because there's no guarantee that their NHL club is going to be in the playoffs or you've got an NBA team that you share the facility with. Well, What's Calgary doing with the saddle dome? Probably not much. So this is way past its prime. Needless to say, though, as a prairie boy, you can uh, appreciate that they do need to do something on the roof line of this. Thing. Like you can't go from a saddle shaped <laughs> arena to just a flat roofed arena. It has to be shaped like a cowboy hat. They have something. to do something with this, right? Come on. I, uh, yeah, I would buy that. Yeah. You know, I look at what Edmonton did and and the roof line of, of that building. I don't know yeah. what it's supposed to represent, but it's kind of cool, right? It Architecturally. Is, yeah. You've got the swirls. And speak of the prairies, I remember. Have you guys ever been to the Crush Can in Moose Jaw? <laughs> no. I've never been. No, no. So I called, I called so many Branded Wheat Kings games there. And depending on your sight line, where you were positioned as a broadcaster, you couldn't see the clock on the far end of the building because the sag in the roof by design was so low that you couldn't see it. And it was so low in the middle that they couldn't put – like a, a new clock, like a jumbotron in there, because you just couldn't. It would yeah. hang too low. So, <laughs> yeah, some of these old buildings, man, they're, they're they're cool historically, but they just don't work in today's world. I'm sorry, the crushed can? Yeah, I yeah. can't remember what it was called, but that was the name. <laughs> that was the oh, okay. term for it. Can, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, the managerial uh, managerial mm-hmm. openings, Calgary, Pittsburgh, Philly, or the coaching openings, Washington, Columbus, Anaheim. What are you hearing there? Uh, Well, you're going to have to remind me of each here. So let's start in Calgary. I mean, we're all waiting for a decision on Daryl Sutter, aren't we? It it feels like that's what's holding everything up in Calgary. Did you say by Daryl Sutter or on Daryl Sutter? On Daryl Sutter. Ah, Um, I think there's there's definite pushback from, I think, from Murray Edwards because, what, Daryl has two years left on his deal. Mm -hmm. Murray doesn't want to lose any money. So And Mm -hmm. he's got a relationship with Daryl. So... You know, there's probably that. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm a big believer that Craig Conroy is ready to be an NHL general manager. So I'd be a little bit surprised if he doesn't get that job organically. Um, but he probably wants ownership to make a decision on the coach. Uh, but we could tell by the exit interviews and from the, the public outpouring the Calgary Flames players and their exit interviews with media that they were fully expecting change. And there are Mm -hmm. lower-level rumblings, and I'm not going to mention the players here, that there are some players who are willing to not come back, even under contract, 
<laughs> if Daryl is still on the bench of the Calgary Flames. So that feels a bit extreme, but you know that 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 seems to be the direction in Calgary. In Pittsburgh, um, the Fenway Group there is is going through a process which they need to go through um, to some degree. And I'm not saying that you know the commissioner's office, as an example, has heavy influence. But this is an unusual where ownership groups, you know, they enlist guys like Deputy Commissioner Bill Daly to pick their brain on potential candidates. So I think that list is being established in Pittsburgh. Um, Philadelphia, look, Danny Breer is the general manager there. I, mm-hmm. Why they haven't announced it officially, I, I don't know. Um, I guess because we know that the Billy King group is is conducting interviews as a search firm um, to forward a collection of names to the Philadelphia Flyers for the president's role and the head of hockey operations role. So maybe they want to get that side of it done. And then when they announce the president of hockey ops, then they also formally announce that Danny Breer is officially the general manager. So we'll see. Mm-hmm. And then what? You wanted Anaheim? Um, Coaching, not sure yeah. on Anaheim. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, again, Pat Verbeek learned from the best when it's cloak and dagger stuff, and that's Steve Eiserman. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah, I, you know, as far as coaches go, um, you know, you got to wait for some of the assistant and associate coaches who are coaching right now in, in the NHL. You know, you've got, we talked about New Jersey and the Rangers earlier. What's going to become of Andrew Burnett? Andrew Burnett is coaching in the NHL as a head coach next year. Maybe that's in New Jersey. Right. I mean, maybe they just decide, you know, let's let's go a different direction than Lindy Ruff, whose contract is up. I don't know, but I could see that happen. I could see that happening. You know, Jim Hiller, there's lots of, you know, people who think that he's going to be an NHL head coach. So, yeah, I mean, Anaheim will go about their business very, very quietly, I'm sure. So the video of Brunette uh, that surfaced last week in Florida with the police officers and uh, having too much to drink behind the golf cart, that's not going to affect his candidacy as a head coach uh, I don't this offseason? So. No? Nah, I don't think so. And look, I'm not advocating, I'm not condoning, I'm not saying anything in support of this. I'm sure he's embarrassed by it. Um, is there a difference between being behind the wheel of a golf cart <laughs> as opposed to being behind the wheel of a of a vehicle on a highway in city streets any of that feels like it to me but you know obviously you shouldn't be driving anything including your lawnmower if you're uh, intoxicated but i i i haven't heard that as a detractor other gotcha. than media people like us having conversations about it one last word on yeah. calgary on uh, yeah. you know sometimes the nice guys do finish last and, and you, you, there's no explanation sometimes for why a gm you know gets fired from his first gig and then yeah. you don't hear from him again but we there's countless examples of that in the national hockey league um i, I hope brad for living gets another job is, is, is he is he going to be quick to get another job or is he going to have to work his way back fight tooth and nail no it'll be as quick as he wants it to be, I think, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of, of difficult scenarios that he had to be a part of and had to manage in Calgary and automatically think of the Billy Peters situation, right? Like he hired him from Carolina and he thought he was going to be a rock star. Well, I'm not supposed to say that according to a commercial, yeah. <laughs> uh, a superstar. How's that as a, as an NHL head coach? And, you know, the world got got hold of a, a situation, and it, it, it mm-hmm. you know, Troy Living and Company had to do what they did with Billy Peters. Uh, I think he's an excellent NHL general manager. I think that there are owners out there who feel the same. I know he's highly regarded by head office in the National Hockey League. Maybe he needs a break. You know, maybe mm-hmm. he just needs to, to set or reset and, and just breathe for a bit. I think he's going to be careful in – making his next selection. Like, let's use Pittsburgh as an example here, right? I I mentioned earlier Fenway is putting their list together. How can Brad Trilliving's name not be at or near the top of that list? Now, if you're Brad, of course you'd like to be manager of the Pittsburgh Penguins, but do you really want to be the guy that either doesn't give Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, and Chris Letang the insulation and the pieces to make another run for a playoff spot? Do you really want to be the guy that has to go into this and maybe have a conversation with Sid or Malkin that says, "Mm, we're renovating here, fellas. You know, if you want to go a different direction, I'll do my level best. I'm not so sure that Tree or anyone Mm -hmm. wants to have to do that. That's a pickle. 
That's yeah. a uh, thing I'll say about Trey Living, and every time we talk to him, he uh, bemoans how brief a period he spends in Penticton and Summerland in the off season <laughs> because of the busy schedule about being GM. He has earned a full spring and summer in uh, yes. Summerland or Penticton. <laughs> yes. Secondly, careful Billy Idol might be jumping out of the bushes there at your place. Those are good ads. Those are Drags. good ads. They're like very it. good. And uh, we'll see you next week with a leather vest with plenty of zippers. Right, All right guys. Enjoy All right. the playoffs. Thank you.